Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar of the Marian Fathers here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy, and we're happy you could join us here on EWTN for Living Divine Mercy. This week, we have an important topic that is biblical, and that is the body and how we need to control the flesh through our spirit. Let's hear our guest host, Father Mark Barron, tell us more about theology of the body. We live in an age that has a lot of questions about some fundamental realities, like when does life begin? What does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? Can a man become a woman? Can a woman become a man? What is marriage? The word body can have various meanings and can refer to a variety of different things. We can speak about the body of a car, a body of water, We can speak about the body of evidence. We can refer to a legislative body. We can even say that a glass of wine has body or a person's hair lacks body. Of course, as a priest and a member of the human race, when I use the word body, I most often am referring to what you see here. That is the material part of my humanity. Speaking of body, have you ever pondered why we have a body? Like, why did God create us with a body that looks like this? And why did God create us with two different kinds of bodies, the male and the female? What is the body's ultimate purpose? There was one man who did do a lot of thinking about these questions. And from 1979 to 1984, he gave 129 lectures that reflected upon human embodiment and its meaning especially in light of God's creative plan for marriage and sexuality as revealed in sacred scripture. And that man was Pope St. John Paul II. The talks he gave proposed to the church and to the world a deeper understanding of the meaning of the human body, especially as it is, as it is expressed in its masculine and feminine forms. Why did the Pope focus so much on the nature and meaning of the human body? The Pope's main concern in giving this teaching was to overcome a dualistic understanding of the human person. Dualism was the fruit of the scientific rationalism of the 17th century philosopher René Descartes. It stated that human nature was no longer to be identified as a body-soul unity. Rather, It was to be understood as being composed of two substances, a thinking part and a bodily part. This is significant because this concept of man reduced the identity of the human person to be just a disembodied thinking substance and thus diminishing the importance of the body. For in his mechanistic worldview, Descartes held that material reality was devoid of value and meaning. Its only purpose was to be used by man as raw material for the sake of human progress. And being associated with the material world then, the human body was stripped of its intrinsic value and meaning and was reduced to being like a piece of Play-Doh, something that could be molded and manipulated by man for his own designs. And this mechanistic worldview of material reality then stripped the body of its richness And thus, the true nature of things, like sex, became invisible to man. It was Descartes' skewed vision of things that was negatively influencing modern man's understanding of the meaning of the body, love, and sex in such a way that the moral teachings of the church were being called into question. It is for this reason that the Pope's main reflection in the theology of the body is the idea that God created man and woman with distinct bodies that are not meaningless mechanisms, but rather means of expression in the language of love, especially marital love. In describing the body in this manner, Pope John Paul identified that the highest meaning of the body is to be found in what he calls its spousal capacity. What does this mean? The spousal or nuptial capacity of the body simply means that The body has the ability to express love. 
Love that is expressed through the body has the character of allowing the person to be a gift to another. When this gift is mutually given, it forms the foundation of spousal love. This is why the body's ultimate meaning is spousal. What enables the body to have this spousal capacity? Pope John Paul understands the spousal meaning of the body to be founded upon two truths. One is the understanding of the sacramentality of the body, and the other is what God has revealed about the mystery of his inner life as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let me first discuss this concept of the body as a sacrament. The concept of the sacramentality of the body is meant to recognize that the human body possesses some of the qualities of a sacrament. What does this mean? In general, a sacrament is a physical sign that points towards or communicates a spiritual reality. We receive spiritual realities in physical ways because God designed the spiritual power of our intellect to depend upon our bodily powers to help us access spiritual truths. In other words, our intellect uses the information gained from our bodily senses in order to abstract the spiritual truth contained in it. By creating our intellect to be dependent on the body for knowledge so that we come to know spiritual things through physical realities, God basically designed us to have a sacramental vision of reality. It is for this reason that Scripture tells us in various places that we can come to know something about God by pondering His visible creation. That the invisible God, in order for us to know Him better, took on our flesh so as to make Himself visible to us. It is also why Jesus, who is the Word made flesh, established a visible church and communicates His saving grace through the material used in the sacraments. But the sacramental nature of our being isn't just in how we come to know spiritual realities through the physical, but it is also in how we express the spiritual through the physical. Because of the close union between the spiritual soul with the body, insofar as it is the soul that animates the body with life and gives it its proper human form, it is the body that makes visible man's spiritual dimension. This is very significant because it is our spiritual soul and its power of intellect and will that gives us the capacity to have an interior life, to be able to think our own thoughts, to be able to be aware of our own feelings, to discern and judge what we experience. All this that happens on the inside of us is destined to be communicated, and this happens through the body. Catechism tells us that it is through the profound union of body and soul that our bodies reveal or make visible the invisible reality of our spirits. And John Paul II makes this clear when he says that the body, in fact, and it alone, is capable of making visible what is invisible, the spiritual and the divine. Because our spiritual soul is the foundation of our personhood, then the body doesn't just express our spirits, but in expressing our spirits, it expresses the person. In this way, the body reveals the person and speaks the truth of the person. But according to John Paul II, the body in its sacramental capacity doesn't just express the personal dimension of man, it also has the capacity to make visible something of the mystery of God himself. So God not only wants our body to reveal the person, but he also wants to speak to us something about himself through the human body. And what he wants to speak to us through it is about his inner life as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that he is love and that the three persons of the Trinity exist as a communion of persons whose unity is the product, so to speak, of the eternal exchange of love that takes place within God's inner triune life. In the very life of the Trinity, then, the notion of nuptial or spousal love and gift find their origin. It is through our maleness and femaleness, then, 
that God has imprinted a call to each human person to participate in a created version of this eternal exchange of love. This means that through the diversity of the sexes, God has created the human body with a capacity to express love because it is only the body that can make visible what is invisible. Thus, God gave us male and female bodies so we can express love through them, especially in a sexual manner, so as to make visible this invisible mystery of God who is love. This is the heart of what the Pope is trying to communicate to us through the theology of the body. And this is the answer to the heirs of Descartes. And, and it's an answer to the, to the um, reduction of the human body to being just like a lump of Play-Doh, something we can manipulate. God didn't give us a body to manipulate at will. He gave us a body for a purpose. And that purpose is to express love human love, and as we express human love, we are meant to be a reflection of divine love. There's so much more to discover in the theology of the body, but I encourage you to learn more and dive deeper. And a good place to start is Christopher West Theology of the Body Institute at tobinstitute.org. Now let's go back to Father Chris. God bless you. Well, thank you, Father Mark, for that insight on such an important topic, especially today. Now, let's talk with Mike Davis, who has an incredible talent, uh, speaking of the body, of putting sacred images of the body onto canvas right before your very eyes. I've always had this desire to inspire people. Back in 2008, I got a phone call. He was a youth director. He knew I was freelancing, and he said, hey, Mike, I have an idea. I'm wondering if you'd want to come to the youth conference and create a painting of the face of Jesus on stage in front of 500 high school kids. One, I didn't like getting up in front of people. One, I'd never imagined getting up and painting in front of people. And so my initial response was, no, thank you. And before we hung up the phone, he just challenged me. He said, just do me a favor and think about it. Well, over the course of the next few weeks, there's just something knocking on my heart. I got to the point where I said, you know what? Maybe this is something I should just give a try. And so I called this gentleman back. I said, I want to accept your invitation. Then I jumped online. I started researching and looking for an appealing image of Jesus. I wanted something masculine. I want something a little rugged. And I found this image that I really liked. And then I just began to practice and rehearse. And the day the event came, I was a nervous wreck. I got on stage. Thank goodness it was also a praise and worship band on stage to create some distraction and uh, created the painting. And much to my surprise, I didn't die. After that experience, I realized this is really exhilarating and facing my fears and kind of getting out of my comfort zone. But at the same time, I didn't think to myself, boy, I found my ticket. This is what the Lord's calling me to. I just looked at it as one opportunity. And then I went back to taking commission jobs. Well, I'd gotten a couple more opportunities the next year or so. That was in 2010. A wonderful Catholic lady approached me and she said, you know, Mike, I love the commission work that you do, but I really feel like I could get that work from a lot of different artists. But this live painting thing that you've done a few times, it's unique, it's different, it's fascinating. I think you should really consider giving that a go. I took her advice and I started to promote myself as a live performance painter. And, and in my wildest dreams, I would have never imagined that the Lord would have presented this door, that my life would look like it does now. My first performance painting that I ever did took around 35 minutes. And, and I thought that was just normal for a live performance painter. But a friend of mine sent me a video of the premier live performance painter. And this guy was whipping out live performance paintings in five, six minutes. And I realized when I saw that video, if this is a, a road that I'm gonna continue to go down, I've gotta come out of my shell. I've gotta learn to inspire. I've gotta learn to entertain. I've gotta learn to be quicker. I gotta learn to be not so concerned about every nuance of the image. I'm not, I'm not doing commissions when I'm on stage. Well, I'm still a little nervous and I think that's a good thing. 
90% of the time when I'm painting, my back is to the audience. So I, I can focus on the creative process. An audience doesn't know what I'm creating. It may look spontaneous and in the moment, but that's because I've rehearsed it enough times that it looks like everything's just falling in place. It creates that wow factor. And if I can create something quickly in front of the audience, from going from a blank, dark canvas to this image coming to life right before their eyes, it's an experience that they haven't seen before. I have some great opportunities to create in a number of faith-based environments, whether it's youth conferences, praise and worship events, I've done confirmation retreats, youth rallies. So I'm creating Catholic artwork. At the same time, I'm being called to create and share my gifts outside of those Catholic circles with these amazing charitable organizations to help raise funds that's gonna help out kids that are abused or families that are in need. Well, especially being here from Kansas City, there's no individual that is in more demand currently than the quarterback of the Kansas City Chiefs, Patrick Mahomes. So it just makes sense to create imagery of Patrick Mahomes to help out these organizations so that they can turn around and help out those in need. My favorite subject matter is the faith-based imagery, the Catholic imagery that I'm invited to paint because it's the most fulfilling. It's the highest form of beauty when I'm able to paint the face of Jesus, the Blessed Mother, the Holy Spirit, or a famous well-known saint that speaks to the heart in a greater way than any of the other images that, that I create. The divine mercy kind of came about organically in my life. So I have a dear friend who has passed away. He was a priest in the Crookston Diocese in Minnesota. And one of my very first commissions after I left the corporate world was a request of his for one of his very small parishes. He wanted an image of the Divine Mercy. So this was one of my very first introductions to St. Faustina uh, and her message of the Divine Mercy. My life at one point looked a lot different than it does now. And I was uh, consumed by worldly things and worldly ideas and certainly still have my challenges. But through the Lord's grace and His direction, He continues to, I feel, pull me on a different path. And all of that stems from His mercy. There's a specific path that the Lord wants me on. And part of that path is uh, using my gifts as an artist. That path is also practicing my Catholic faith to the best of my ability, attending Mass, going to reconciliation, getting in front of the Blessed Sacrament through adoration. I think the faith is really simple. It doesn't mean that it's easy to practice. We as humans, we want to be comfortable. We don't want the journey to be so uncomfortable. But it's necessary, and we can't separate the two. It's the good with the difficult, and we're called to carry our cross. It's part of our calling. I always say if I could, if I could pick up my studio and move it out south, you know, there's plush green grass, there's beautiful trees, there's conveniences that aren't here, but is the Lord speaking to me saying, those could possibly be distractions, and I've placed you here. So after being here for a number of years, I realized that being isolated Working in solitude is a real gift and it's created space in my mind. It's created space in my heart. It's made room for the Lord to work on me and share my gifts with, with the world. As some people may know, but many people may not, I was once upon a time uh, married, and I'll say it in scare quotes because the marriage was annulled, so therefore technically it well, wasn't a marriage. 
um, which is which is true. But I never really realized that until I was coming into the Catholic Church and found out about theology of the body and that <clears throat> work of John Paul II's beautifully lays out what God's intent for marriage was. And I could easily see how short, you know, uh, I came up to meeting its expectations, in large part because I didn't realize fully what those expect expectations were. So being a brand new Catholic and, and slowly digesting, you know, this, this work that we call Theology of the Body, a big part of me really wanted a, a redo, so to speak. I wanted to give marriage a try um, and do it the right way, the way God had intended. Uh, but then I found out about this whole other vocation that I've never heard of before. Of course, the word vocation being new to me at that point in my, my life. Um, this, this calling to be celibate, you know, this, this calling that Yes, there are some who are called to marriage, and then there are those who are, are called to something else. And that that vocation to be a consecrated celibate or to be, you know, as a, a diocesan priest or, or even the single life, you know, for many people um, can be a beautiful um, way of showing God's love and beauty in the world, that it can also be an example of his love. Now let's hear from Father Anthony as he talks about what St. Paul has to say about the flesh in the Bible. While we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are discharged from the law, dead to that which held us captive, so that we serve not under the old written code but in the new life of the Spirit. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I should not have known sin. I should not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, finding opportunity in the commandment, wrought in me all kinds of covetousness. For sin finding opportunity in the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and just and good. St. Paul sums up the predicament by saying, I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. We generally want to do what we know is right and good, but our fears, passions, impatience, and self-centeredness all too often seem to grip us and get in the way. We can try to blame our moral failures on others, but we are responsible for our own faults in the end. St. Paul does not despair in the face of human failures because he sees them in the light of God's mercy. We do not have to earn God's transforming love. Indeed, we need to welcome it with open, penitent, and faithful hearts. The divine gift of grace, though freely offered, will cost us dearly to receive. Only a heart willing to let go of its selfish delusions and stubborn pride will have room for the Lord to enter. The transformation of our hearts requires deep repentance and purifying penance on our part, but the result is well worth the cost. In the end, we can say with St. Paul, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now you shall consider my love in the Blessed Sacrament. Here I am entirely yours, soul, body, and divinity, as your bridegroom. You know what love demands, one thing only, reciprocity. O oh my Jesus, you know that I desire to love you with a love that no soul has ever before loved you with. 
I would like the whole world to be transformed into love for you, my betrothed. You feed me with the honey and milk of your heart. From my earliest years, you reared me for yourself alone so that I would know how to love you now. You know that I love you because you alone know the depth of the sacrifice I offer you each day. Well, thank you, everybody, for being with us this week. And please be with us next week. We have a very special show. What I'm actually going to do is go into our shrine, be at the altar, open up the missal, and I'm going to walk you through every line of the Mass and explain what the Mass means and how it comes from Scripture. So please be with us. You don't want to miss this one. So until then, may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>